Hi, everybody. Welcome to AML in Paris. I'm Atreya, the Director of Legal Research. I'm tuning in from New York. And I'd also love to know more about you guys, where you're tuning in from. So I will be sharing a survey shortly, and we'd love to know more about you. But for now, I will hand it over to our team and to Irina Tarsis, the founder of the center, who is in Paris at the moment. So Irina, it is all yours now. Thank you, Athreya. Um, thank you, Athreya. Thank you very much to Rachel Sundar, who has been working on this event um, very long and diligently. And we have learned a lot about organizing events at Sciences Po and in Paris. Uh, first of all, you have to learn how to type uh, in a different fashion. Um, as Athreya mentioned, we are uh, doing a quick survey to see where you guys are dialing in from. Um, I expect that some of you are in France, just are in Paris, but didn't like the weather and didn't come in person. But we also have many, many people who are joining us from um, across the world. Um, so it would be really lovely to see where you're from and what your interests are, and we'll share the results momentarily. Um, as you can see on your screens, um, this is an inaugural event that Center for Art Law New York slash Zurich um, is doing in Paris. Um, we love learning and we love challenges. Um, we also think there's a lot of talent and a lot to learn from colleagues and members of the trade across the world. Um, so welcome to our first Art Law in Paris event. Um, thank you to those who have um, answered the questions. Uh, you can see that many of you are attending this event or attending a Center for Art Law event for the first time. Um, we have a fair number of people from the United States, a few from Paris, a few from Switzerland, and many from other. Um, there's going to be a survey sent out. Um, you can give us more feedback, not only tell us where other is, but also perhaps how to um, do things slightly faster and better. For example, where is A on the French keyboard? I still don't know. Um, all right, occupation, many students, no artists, I guess no surprise, a number of attorneys, legal practitioners, researchers, and a couple art market professionals. Um, I wonder if there are many who are not identifying as such, um, but you, you guys are um, the ones that we're learning from and hopefully providing tools too. And then um, thank you for letting us know how you learned about this event. All right, uh, we're gonna close the survey and we're gonna turn to the subject at hand, anti-money laundering and the art market. Um, very briefly, Center for Art Law is everywhere online and apparently in person. So check out what we do if you haven't yet. And um, we invite you to subscribe and read lots and lots of articles that our um, colleagues, interns, um, guest writers are contributing and attend our upcoming programs. If you dare, we will go to space in April. There is such a thing as Celestial Art Law, and it's a three-day event that we'll cram into an hour for now. Um, again, take take a look at the events that we're doing. The reason why we're really focusing on anti-money laundering um, is because it's a big, important subject. We thought it was really important to do a study of uh, various jurisdictions, how different countries are approaching the subject, and if you're interested, um, we have 17 jurisdictions covered in the first edition of the anti-money laundering study. Uh, we're also hoping to start on the second edition and include Switzerland and other countries in this project. So if you're interested, if you have feedback you want to share, please do. Um, our panel today is going to focus primarily on French law and English law. There's a lot to learn. Um, There'll be some references to US um, attempts or efforts to regulate anti-money laundering um, and the art market. Um, big reveal, there hasn't been that much, um, or there's been done a lot, but not enough yet. Uh, we're joined here in person by Laura Bertilotti, who is going to be speaking about French regulations. Anthony Meyer, he is a brave member of the art trade who will talk about how he and others are supposed to be um, conducting their very complicated uh, business and uh, make compliance look easy uh, as well. 
And we have two guests from the United Kingdom. Um, Alex Melia and Rana Neville are attorneys who will talk about what the UK has done. Um, this is very interesting for us because EU regulations do not, but yet influence UK regulations and UK regulations have a very important impact on what other countries such as the United States are doing. All right, so this is our plan. Again, I wanted to, to thank Athreya Matur and Rachel Sundar for all the work they've done. Uh, there's a fantastic handout that is uh, being shared with you. If it hasn't gone out yet, it will go out um, today over the course of this program with um, helpful readings and additional information that you can put to good use. All right, um, I am a lawyer, um, so I start some of my presentations with disclaimers. What we're doing here today is for educational purposes. If you think you need to talk to an attorney, um, you may need to talk to an attorney and you should. You should not take what we're saying uh, entirely um, at its face value and we're not forming any attorney-client relations as a result. So this program is just in time, why? Because we're still in 2024. There are many regulations in different jurisdictions um, that concern luxury goods, art market, and they are getting more complicated and um, and why. Um, I think the current events are definitely impacting what the art market is experiencing, um, but the issues haven't been on the table only for two years. Um, they have been going on for a while before the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine, before um, EU passed their 2020 um, fifth uh, directive. So we're gonna look at what different countries are doing as promised. Um, we will look at the British art market guidelines and at the various alerts that have been issued by the National Crime Agency to be helpful to the art market participants. Um, from the US perspective, this is gonna go really fast. Um, there've been studies by the treasury, by um, various um, FinCEN and other agencies indicating that the art market is susceptible to illicit activities. Um, susceptible means it could very well be affected. It doesn't mean that all the transactions that take place are suspect, but it means that art market participants need to be mindful um, and not just focus on the art objects that they're handling, but they also should be focusing on um, the clients and the sources of funds. All right, um, for United States, um, this is not the main point, but we go back to US Bank Secrecy Act from 1970, indicating certain transactions need to be um, studied carefully. And as of recently, persons engaged in the trade of antiquities are also included in the Bank Secrecy Act uh, requirements. If uh, people don't comply and somehow there is money laundering uh, happening, there are criminal penalties and fines. Um, and there are tools that are available. They're not perfect. They're not easy to use. They're like French keyboard, but um, there are tools out there to help you conduct your due diligence to figure out if the people you are dealing with are at this moment um, prob problematic for some reason and are sanctioned for some reason. Um, so this is the US. Why is it important to do due diligence? Um, at the bare minimum, if you want to be successful in the business, and last in the business long enough to be successful, um, dotting the I's and sometimes speaking with attorneys to understand your uh, responsibilities is probably a good idea. All right, so with that, I'm going to turn um, <laughs> the camera to Anthony, who will speak about his experience as um, the art market participant, a very um, senior and um, important art market participant about his experiences. Um, he's based in France, a full biography for all of our speakers um, are included in the handouts. Um, Anthony, thank you so much for being willing to talk about these important topics and just hit play. I feel like a sacrificial man, but um, I will try and hold my... <laughs> Thank you for inviting me in the first case. Uh, it's very rare that uh, ground floor 
Rest so peace. sorry. I, I think um, the audio may be a little low uh, at the hold end. On, hold on a second. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, the audio is low. Is it on mute? Do you think? Oh, hold on a second. So Athre, is that okay? Is it better or you can't hear? Um, Can't hear yet. Maybe you could test it out again. So sorry. Um, I have a feeling that the mic is working not from here, but from the from the computer. Is it okay if we ask you to come sit here? So first. Because it is from this. Because... I wonder if it's connected probably. Hold on a second. All right, we're we're switching. One second. Musical chairs. Musical chairs. Is that better? Yes, I can hear you much better now. Okay. You. So I think we need to sit here. Yes. One more. Okay. And yes. Thank you. That is great. Targeted. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Art Law Foundation for uh, this invitation. I'm uh, I find it very brave. Um, your behalf as well to uh, invite grassroots and ground floor dealers because we have most of us some of us are recycled as antique dealers after a first uh, how would I put it as a first career but most of us have very little legal uh, training and so uh, when confronted with this type of administrative uh, somewhat Kafkaesque uh, situation, uh, it uh, becomes very problematic for us. And we have to rely, of course, on uh, our legal counselors and uh, our associate associations, uh, trade associations, which of which I am a member of the Syndicat National des Antiquaires, which is one of the main French antique dealer associations. And I'd just like to say from the point of view of antique dealers and art dealers, as individual market participant and as well as trade associations, we are not opposed to the principle of AML FTF regulations. We're simply worried by the implementation at the level of our small and micro businesses of the obligation to control our customers and their lifestyle with a legal responsibility for us that is sanctioned and which reaches far beyond our responsibilities and especially our capacities to implement these verifications. One of the things that uh, we do have to make understood is that the annual turnover of the vast majority of antique dealers and art dealers, not speaking about the contemporary art market or old masters or large dealerships dealing in modern and 20th century art. I'm talking about people who deal in works of art objects and small mid-level range paintings. Uh, the annual turnover is probably less than two to three, two to three million euros per dealership. And above all, the average shopping cart of an antique dealer is on average five to 25,000 euros. The transactions on top of it are not repeated beyond one or two, three times a year, depending on the customer's means. And 99, possibly more of these small sums are paid either by credit card or bank transfer with a very small amount paid by check. And of course, nothing over 10,000 euros paid by cash. Many of the transactions are settled in several installments sometimes spread over three, six, eight months. We therefore find it very difficult to see how this relatively small market can contribute significantly to money laundering and terrorism financing, although granted it can. The application of the guidelines is basically impossible at art fairs and art markets. And this is something which we have uh, tried to deal with, with the governing agencies. We tried to explain it to them. And I will develop a little further. When an art dealer is at an art fair, uh, the opening moment is most crucial. And that is when the collectors are going to congregate on the galleries stand and they're going to try and buy. And if you are confronted with someone who you do not know, but who is offering a credit card for a purchase above 10,000 euros, 
you're going to take it. You have to, it's your livelihood. If I have to say to the person, I'm terribly sorry, please, would you kindly pull out your fiscal returns? I need your uh, permanent residence. I need the ways and means that you have acquired all of these funds and the funds that are using, do they come from your grandmother's inheritance or did you sell something or are you a drug dealer? None of this is actually feasible. And so it can't be done. It's simply impossible. We have requested uh, from French Customs, which is the governing agency for AML here in France, uh, a time frame, a limitation of seven working days or whatever, enabled to comply with the necessity that they uh, are putting forth. But uh, so far, we haven't gotten anywhere. Also, the other thing is when a person comes into a stand or to an opening of a gallery and buys something within the first minute, most of these purchases are impulse purchases. And so it's done in a very, very short time with very, very little reflection. Um, and if they pay by credit card, they can take the piece with them. We're guaranteed payment, it's not a problem. So the whole anti-money laundering system doesn't function with the way the art market functions. And this is a huge problem. In order to comply with AML and TF regulations, the administration requires us to present a personalized roadmap with our own criteria to use in judging which are the triggers that we have to look into and which we have to check on a list that we have to create based on our own understanding of what they want us to look into. We need to appoint and to train a person for these audits. We are under the obligation to create customer files composed of confidential information, such as tax, physical addresses, bank account numbers, sources of income. We need to verify the frozen assets file. We must store all of these checks in the customer file for possible control or later denunciation. An example here is the verification of the source of funds. When somebody gives us a credit card or a bank wire, we need to know what bank it comes from. Well, banks don't give us that information on our statements. And when we go and ask for it, it takes months to get, an, to get any kind of response from a bank. The transaction that is begun will eventually be followed by a reportedly confidential report to TrackFan, which is the name of the French uh, financial tracking agency here, with a possible temporary freeze of the transaction, and again, possibly its continuation under the direction of the TrackFan unit, and then its eventual abandonment, or more paradoxically, the successful conclusion for the merchant of the transaction, although the denounced buyer will probably be prosecuted. So the way it has been explained to us is that um, if we enter into a transaction with someone who appears to be suspicious and we report this person, Trackfan can oblige us to stop the transaction or they can oblige us to continue, which makes me part of the Secret Service and uh, or a deputy, and I'm not equipped for that. And I'm not allowed to inform the person that they're being investigated or that this transaction is subject to some form of suspicion. So uh, very, very complicated life. The most surprising thing about all of this is how the obvious lack of knowledge of the MO, the art market, and how it works. There was no apparent, I'm sorry, there was apparently no prior consultation with stakeholders there was no creation of a cons cons consultation committee at the level of art market professionals and their representatives before the laws were drafted and implemented. Nobody spoke to us. Nobody came and said anything. One day we woke up and this law was in place. In response to all that I have just mentioned, the Syndicat National des Antiquaires set up a series of information and training sessions. I'm just going to say how we have been trying to deal with this, starting with the invitation of Colonel Hubert Percy Dusser, who was the head of the OCBC, and Jean-Luc Boyer, divisional commander. Uh, this is the um, stolen illicit works of art unit in the French police. This was a meeting with members of the SNA presenting the modalities of application of the regulations on the origin and compliance of the new legislative measures to be implemented regarding anti-money laundering, the monitoring and the prevention of it. 
Then French Customs, which is now the administration responsible for AML TF, decided to implement a self-assessment to be carried out by market actors. Self-assessment meaning we were landed with a questionnaire. It was sent out to all the identified associations, but of course that did not cover the whole art market because a large number of art market professionals are not members of associations. This was September of October of 23. It was mandatory, but non-sanctionable, meaning that if you didn't answer, supposedly nothing happened, but it was understood that it was better to answer. This was in order for the French Customs and the AML unit to better understand the, the numbers and the way the numbers function in the art market. So in conjunction with the administration, we organized a meeting in the presence of Monsieur Guillaume Roger, who was the supervisor of the AML-TF mission within the Customs Directorate, and Mrs. Mathilde Durand of the AML Prefiguration mission in October of 23. And uh, during this presentation, Monsieur Roger made it very clear that the numbers, the information on the illicit art market that are being touted and used and displayed by the regulation agencies and which are used by example the eu to create these laws is all wrong or at least is not correct meaning they don't have the numbers so this famous ballpark figure of 68 or 67 billion euros annually that is uh, circulating in the illicit art market they finally admitted that it doesn't exist. At least nobody knows how much it is. We have been fighting these numbers for at least 10 years. Subsequently, we organized through our legal and tax commission under the directory of our treasurer, Christophe Yoko, face-to-face -face training sessions for our members. We did two face-to-face -face and one Zoom with Mr. Alexandre Marignon, is a tax lawyer who works with us, to explain the obligations of the AML legislation to our members. As a result of these presentations, members who were present received a certificate from the SMA. I say this in very seriously, but also a bit tongue in cheek, because who are we to issue a certificate? Except that we did provide the training, and yes, we did note that the specific person was there, and it's a tiny little uh, drop in the bucket that shows that at least some form of due diligence was done by the member of the SMA. The problem of the use of erroneous or unverifiable figures and data was confirmed by a study done by Dr. Donna Yates, an archaeologist and associate professor at the Department of Criminal Law and Criminology at Maastricht University, during the last high-level event, Dialogue with the Art Market at Brafa, on January 30, 24. This was organized by the European Commission. And during this very official presentation, Dr. Georg Hausler, who was Director for Culture, Creativity, and Sport at the European Commission, confirmed that the European Commission had taken note of the wrong information and had determined to talk to market players. A committee of experts and advisors made up of members of the art market has been formed, and we are waiting to see how this consultation will be conducted and the results. To sum up a situation that is delicate and complex to say the least, it should be noted that two colleagues from the SMA were sanctioned, not for not reporting suspicious behavior within a transaction, but they were sanctioned for some form of non-implementation of the internal application of rules. These are the rules that they themselves are supposed to kind of create and formulate and uh, these two members were uh, sanctioned by French customs in a certain manner, which is quite public. The only thing that was positive in the sanction was that uh, they were allowed to remain anonymous. So I thank you for listening to this short presentation of uh, the art market's life on the ground floor. Uh, we are subject to this for many, many years. I just like to add one thing. The art market in France has always been obliged to obtain information. We have always been obliged when we buy from a person to get a copy of their identity card. 
we have all sorts of obligations concerning invoicing, etc. Granted, this is just one more set of obligations. The problem is here is the sanctioning is way beyond uh, the level of responsibility that we can uh, deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will hold on um, and ask questions after everybody presents. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> to follow up on Anthony's uh, presentation, maybe to give you a bit of background on the French regulation, and Anthony talked about French customs, uh, Tracfin, uh, the police. So I think there are a number of players, and they each have different roles. Um, so maybe first, uh, I would say that our French AML regulation um, translate the EU that you know the various EU uh, directive as well as some recommendation from the FATFI from the Financial Action Task Force, and they're um, included in our French uh, monetary code. Uh, as Anthony mentioned, our enforcement authority in France is uh, the French customs, uh, but that's only one part of the more generic uh, um, framework because you have the customs on the one hand that control um, the AML processes and um, uh, who are regulating all the art market uh, players. So they regulate uh, dealers since 2016. They regulate auction houses and um, uh, precious metals dealers since 2020. Uh, so when they come and control you, they can actually go back to that date uh, from which they uh, started regulating that specific profession. Um, and, and as you mentioned, uh, uh, dealers, auction houses are uh, some of the 42 uh, uh, profession that are regulated um, together with uh, uh, banks, lawyers, notaries in France. So, um, and, and I, I won't go back into the numbers and how it is justified or not, but I think the, there was uh, a determination that as uh, banks can be used to lend their money. Um, art dealers and, and auction houses and other market players who are uh, dealing with those um, uh, artworks or uh, jewelry are objects that can be used to uh, uh, launder money, evade tax, uh, help uh, terrorist financing. So um, AML obligation in France uh, and elsewhere what custom will control is any tra transaction above uh, 10,000 euros. Uh, but then, and, and I'll talk about it a bit more later, you have the sanction regime that starts at the first euro. So um, there are two different things. Um, so customs are competent to come and control the market professionals. Then you have, you mentioned TRACFIN. So TRACFIN um, in France is, is really the, um, the, the body that will receive all informa information collected uh, uh, from the various professional and it's a, it's a sort of intelligence uh, body and they receive a uh, track file report, which would be the equivalent of a, of a SAR uh, um, uh, under UK law, for example. And uh, as you mentioned, you're supposed to send a sanction, uh, uh, sorry, um, a suspicious activity report before you enter into the transaction. And actually, uh, TRACFIN has 10 business days to oppose uh, possibly um, the transaction. In my experience, uh, TRACFIN doesn't respond at all, which can actually be quite frustrating. And, and, and I think this has been uh, given to TRACFIN as a feedback um, that, um, art market professional may be reluctant to report to TRACFIN because they don't really know where those reports go, how they're used, um, and usually there's no follow-up. So you you file this report um, and then pretty much nothing. So you can proceed with your transaction, but then why um, is it very useful? It's because actually as an art market professional, if you file this SAR, then <clears throat> you're exonerated from any liability. So uh, that's why we're encouraged to actually uh, file 
uh, those reports because at least it shows that we uh, uh, determined there was some sort of suspicious activity and we've reported it and there was no position. So we um, we went on with the, the, the transaction, but um, but we're not at fault as uh, we uh, reported. Um, so track fin is one um, one part, and actually track fin and the customs have published uh, common guidelines uh, for the art market professionals. So they're working together, and allegedly where all those track fin reports go. Uh, they can be forwarded to public prosecutor, they can be forwarded to the police, um, and they are also shared with customs. So there's this common intelligence where um, the all the information is fed to the various um, enforcement agencies. Um, what do the, the AML regulation containing the French Monetary Code say? Um, I think there are four uh, main pillars. Number one is to have a compliance um, referral within your company and when it's it should be uh, distinct from the client facing person and when you have of course only a one person shop then you know the 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 director uh, the, of the of uh, the gallery or, or the 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 solo auctioneer will also be the the compliance uh, referral but if you do have more than one person it should be a different individual who um, is in charge of compliance as opposed to the one who's client facing and this person can also be the track fin a referral because each art market uh, professional in France should nominate and it should be formalized in a document, a track fin, um, a point person who will be in charge of the uh, track fin, uh, suspicious activity reports. So that's one uh, pillar. And, and to note, um, when you have an international company, international gallery, auction house, where you can have a, um, a uniform and global compliance policy, and you may have a compliance officer at the group level based in London, based in New York. Uh, well, you actually need in France to have a local compliance officer who will be um, the referral for track fin and for customs. So if customs come to you uh, to uh, conduct a control and you respond that actually a compliance officer sits in New York and only speaks English, that will not fulfill their requirements. So you actually need someone on the ground. So that's number one. Number two, uh, there's a very important obligation to conduct a risk assessment. And so this risk assessment based on who is your client, where geographically, where do they come from? How often do they come to you? And, and Anthony was mentioning, you know, we have occasional clients that could come maybe only once. Um, if you're in Paris, you wouldn't have the same risk uh, as opposed to maybe a dealer, an auctioneer um, in uh, the region in France who would have a more local client base and knows the clients um, better. Um, if you're in a big city customs, uh, and they've uh, explained that uh, during some trainings with art market professional, if you're in Paris or other big cities, well, your risk is higher because you have a lot of transient clients who just come, you don't know them, they come for one transaction, they go. Um, you have to check where they come from. If they come from a gray zone, uh, you know, uh, a country or a region that uh, is vulnerable to um, uh, corruption, that, you know, wouldn't have uh, AML uh, policies in place, then it's also considered a factor for customs. So, um, also, depending on what you sell, um, you know, types of, of objects, antiquities uh, will be a different risk than uh, jewelry, than uh, painting. So all this needs to be accounted for. Um, and, and so Anthony mentioned the self-assessment that all my art market professionals were sent about nine months ago. So that was part of the, of the, um, the question that they ask, have you conducted a risk assessment. And when custom would come and control you, they would not only check and ask if you have this risk assessment, but whether you actually have a document formalizing this uh, risk assessment. 
Um, then a third pillar, um, so you have this risk assessment and then how are you reacting to the risks that you've assessed? So um, number one is uh, client due diligence. Um, and so depending on the risk, depending on the nature of the relationship, uh, French um, regulators have found that there are four levels of uh, due diligence depending on the type of relationship you have with your client. So there's uh, the first level, which is the lowest bar, uh, and it's called the constant um, due diligence. It's with a regular client. So it's just asking for a proof of ID. Um, and of course, checking that this person is not on a sanctions list. Then you have a simplified um, level of due diligence, then an additional complementaire, uh, in French, uh, for an occasional client or for a client who would be a politically exposed person, for example. And then the highest level, which is enhanced uh, due diligence, and that would be for suspicious activity. So in that case, uh, based on the French guidelines, you would need to file a track fin report. So you would have formalized this categories and you would classify your client under you know, I have one of those four uh, levels of due diligence. And if you've reached this highest level of risk based on um, the, the identity of the client, that could be, uh, you know, corporate client, for example. And that's another red flag for a French custom. If you have uh, a trust that would be based in a tax haven, if you have multiple, if you uh, have multiple companies and you're given an, an org chart and you see that there are a number of shell companies that would account as a red flag for French customs. So if you have that, or if you have um, a client who has usually uh, come to you for a certain type of uh, operation with certain types of artworks at a certain price level, and all of a sudden they come with a completely different uh, uh, type of artwork, and usually they would uh, bring you a 10,000 euro uh, impressionist painting, and all of a sudden they have a 1 million euro contemporary uh, um, artwork that then for custom, that's also a red flag, a, a unusual transaction for that specific client. So you have those levels of, of risks, uh, so depending on the client, on the transaction, and then you also have internal audits. So not only you've put in place all those measures, but you also need to review internally the efficiency of what you've put in place. Uh, and then the last pillar, uh, which is also considered very important, and we can, we saw it in the sanction that have been published a couple of weeks ago, the training of your employees on compliance risks. And if you're in France, then that training also needs to be in French. Uh, supposedly. So same, I was mentioning for an international company, you may have a global compliance policy, global compliance training. Well, it's recommended to have some sort of local training that can be understood locally by your employees on the ground. So training of the, of the personnel is also important. And again, this has to be um, evidenced by uh, some sort of presence sheet, some training materials. And um, and that brings me to the actual controls. And um, we don't have a load of experience and, and uh, historical data on controls because those have started relatively recently in the past year or so. Uh, but there are two uh, phases and parts of the control. Number one is a really a formal uh, control of those processes you have put in place. So really controlling that paperwork and how you formalize your processes. So custom will go and look at your risk assessment. What, you know, have you updated this risk assessment? Because of course the risk assessment is done at a certain point in time, but then if the client comes back six months later, well, maybe that client has now become a personally exposed person, for example, 
or maybe is now on a sanctions. So you need to review and update your risk assessment. So customs first will look at all those uh, documents and how you've evidenced the training, how who is the point person uh, for compliance. Uh, they will come and interview that person. Uh, so they hear, and we see that in in the, um, the sanction decision that we've uh, we've uh, been communicated, uh, the first step is really reviewing what's in place. Then the second part of the control is taking some um, key transaction. So um, I think so far in the control that we've seen, uh, custom have gone back uh, to 2020 for uh, auction house or 2016 for dealers. But so going back to that date where they started um, being the enforcing uh, regulator for, for art market professionals. Mm -hmm. And for each year, they would take a number of uh, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, examples, uh, random examples uh, of uh, sample transaction uh, to see for a specific transaction, have you uh, uh, taken the ID of, of uh, your clients? Uh, have you checked that they're not on a sanction list? Uh, have you checked the provenance of the item? So everything you've done for a specific transaction that starts at, at 10,000 euro. Um, um, and then, <clears throat> and so I, I heard uh, Anthony was saying that they don't actually control uh, if you've reported anything, but actually, so customs and tracfin would be two separate things. So they will not control necessarily how many track file reports or the content of a track file report, but it seems that their uh, controls are more formal of what you formally put in place. And then for a specific transaction, how you've applied all those um, rules and risk assessments to um, the actual client or transaction. Um, then according to customs, uh, at the end of this audit, at the end of this control, they have three uh, options. Either they don't find any breaches or any um, areas of improvement and they simply close the, the audit. So that's one, if you're really lucky and you've really done a great job um, uh, with your AML obligation. Number two um, would be uh, to give you uh, feedback and constructive feedback with some uh, improvement measures. So that would be the middle. Uh, uh, route. And then third one that we've seen with the uh, um, the few sanctions that have been uh, published um, is to actually refer your case to uh, the so-called commission, sanction commission. So it still sits within custom. So some have said, well, it's actually the same body that audits and the, and the same body that will issue the sanction. There's no separation. Um, but it is a different part of custom. It's a separate sanction commission. So uh, the investigators refer the case to the sanction commission. And then at that it's not simply you're sanctioned and there's nothing to say. There's actually a hearing where the art market professional can come and defend itself and present arguments and observations. And then at the end of that hearing, the sanction commission um, can either only issue a warning with you know, the few points and the few breaches that they've found. Uh, they can uh, give a financial um, sanction, so a fine. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you some example of what they've uh, uh, come up uh, as fines in the recent controls. And they can um, suspend the activity of the art market professional for a certain period of time, which is, um, I think, one of the, the most severe sanction, really, uh, because you, you can't um, trade for all that period. And and lastly, they can publish uh, all those sanction, which is also a very uh, serious uh, one, because uh, as Anthony said, for the last two sanctions we've seen, they were anonymous. But it's a small market, so of course, when those sanctions are published, there's an adver very strong adverse effect. So, um, so to come back maybe on quickly on the two sanctions that have been recently published, uh, so they're from October 2023, so quite recent, a few months ago, they concern two uh, galleries, 
Um, and we can see in those, in both decisions that are, you know, in, in many ways similar, <clears throat> that what the customs have found is that the processes in place were undocumented. So again, the, the need to formalize your processes, um, that um, identification of customer was not systematic on certain transaction, there was no proof of ID that was collected, for example. Uh, that the galleries sometimes relay, relied on third parties. They said, well, this client was um, coming from a bank and this transaction had been uh, vouched for by the bank. Well, the this sanction commission says that as a regulated professional, the gallery, the auction house actually has to conduct its own due diligence. So it doesn't matter that you know, this entity had uh, uh, been in business with a bank or had transacted with another regulated uh, um, uh, institution. Um, and then same on training, they uh, noted that the, the, um, all the training processes were only oral. There was no documentation about the trainings. So we see that, um, you know, for both uh, art market professionals, it seems that they had something in place, but that it was not formalized enough. And then in terms of what it means uh, for sanction, uh, each of those galleries um, had a six month trading ban. So it means for six months, they could not uh, conduct their business. Uh, and um, the fines that were uh, given were both against the, the um, entity, the gallery, the corporate entity, as well as for the director. So there's a personal liability. It's not just a corporate liability. Um, and the fines uh, were between 3,000 and 10,000 euros for each of the gallery and the director. Um, so, so it gives some indication as to what customs are after and how they're sanctioning. Um, I would say that um, art market professional, though, have some um, uh, ways of communication and uh, asking question, uh, having training with customs, with the French police or CBC um, through. So uh, Anthony mentioned some um, info session that have been organized with OCBC, with uh, custom for galleries. They uh, conduct similar uh, sessions with auctioneers through uh, the syndicate of uh, auction houses, CIMEV, uh, individually, the auction house would also ask. So they're quite responsive and, and open to our um, comments and, and, and conducting those trainings. Um, uh, but I would say there's a difficulty in the number of um, agencies um, that are responsible for different pieces of uh, this big uh, AML uh, regulation. Um, so sometimes, you know, you may have a suspicion, but there are different people that potentially you need to uh, reach out to. You may need to uh, report uh, through TRACFIN you may need to uh, write to uh, uh, one part of the OCBC that receives uh, reports of suspicious activity. You may want to talk to customs. So there's a multi multiple um, actors. And uh, maybe just one point that we haven't mentioned, but I think that may be relevant for AML is that uh, in France, um, any art dealers has an obligation of a police book uh, and uh, actually now it's a, it's an electronic police book, so it should be a police book that can be consulted online. And if you have uh, the police, so and the police book is controlled by the French police. It's an obligation of the French criminal code. But what the police book records is whenever an object arrives and any movement of the object, so the, you know an object is deposited, he moves, he's sold, who is he sold to, who is he consigned from. So um, any of those move movements have to be recorded in the police book, and that's not a new obligation, um, but uh, but that's an obligation that depends, um, the, which is control and depends on French police and not on customs. 
So it's another example of um, this inflation of norms and and um, and different actors that come into play and could be source of confusion for an art market professional who's confronted with multiple um, rules, but also multiple uh, people and agency they need to uh, report um, and and and. Uh, have as a um, enforcement body and, and regulator. Um, so that was uh, my uh, main points, but happy to answer any question later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Alex, and we are going to put up slides. So um, I come to this topic as an external lawyer to clients. And so my comments, my preliminary comments are going to reflect that perspective a little bit. Um, I'm a financial crime lawyer. I'm UK qualified. So I do AML, I do sanctions. And, and what we're increasingly seeing is a convergence of all of those regulatory obligations, which creates some real life practical compliance problems and complexities. So um, my comments are gonna start um, when I figure out how to use these slides. <laughs> Doing anything? Ah, okay, great, perfect. So do we know? Okay. Yeah, we aren't able to see any slides yet. Ah, okay. So maybe if I just, in the interest of time, I'll just um, start my remarks and the slides can catch me up. So um, I'm gonna start with a few sort of EU level comments and then move over to the UK, which is my first love and what I know and love best. Um, I think, you know, as I look at these issues as an external counsel trying to guide clients through these problems, um, one of the issues I see is, you know, the Fifth Money Laundering Directive is a directive. So it needs to be transposed and translated into each member state's own legislative regime. And whenever I see things like that, I know that that means there's going to be some level of complexity for so for any art market participants who are operating across multiple member states, sort of being able to understand those nuances and implement them into a sort of coherent, holistic approach to compliance is something that's um, really important. I think what we're seeing, certainly in the UK, and I think increasingly in the EU is um, an increased sort of awareness of closing down loopholes and making these processes work better. I think that has been supercharged in the past 24 months, as Arena mentioned, by the situation with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And we've seen it in the AML space. We've also seen it in the sanctions space and in other aspects of financial crime that feed very directly into, into money laundering and anti-money laundering protections. Um, you know, I think I look a little bit at um, the moves now to have a single rule book in the EU for regulated AML businesses, including some art market participants, as very much reflecting the concerns that this sort of convergence um, is really crystallizing. And, you know, I think for those in the art market who've had to sort of struggle and to get to grips with being part of that regulated sector over the past two to three years, it's obviously something that's going to bring more change and the need to evolve processes in some cases. Now, you know, I think there may be some good news stories there. So from the perspective of the new EU AML regulation that will come in over the next few years, um, the idea that there will be more consistency and unification of approach from one member state to another obviously has its advantages likely more so in those member states that already have quite robust rules because you're essentially just rolling those out further. I think where there's the potential for more challenge is for those operating in member states that maybe have a slightly more flexible view of those rules at this point in time who are going to have to elevate their processes. Um, and I think that's particularly true where you have third country subsidiaries as part of your businesses that are going to have to also then implement the parent company's sort of home rules. So, so that's kind of a key change. But I think there are also some tools potentially in that new package that are going to be helpful in terms of sort of guidance and sort of facilitating compliance. So one of those is the creation of AMLA, which is essentially an EU-wide agency that 
will do various things, but of most relevance to the art market will actually provide um, sort of EU level guidance on compliance with the regulated sector rules that are in place. So, you know, there is some scope there to actually reduce some of the complexity that currently exists. Um, similarly, some of the measures in the Six Money Laundering Directive likely will help again with sort of access to information. So um, requiring beneficial ownership registers, sort of member state financial um, investigation units to actually provide their own guidance to people operating in their markets. That starts to build, I think, a body of information that is accessible and helps to actually understand what the obligations are, where the regulators see the lines. So, you know, taken together, I think there likely will be some short term adjustments and changes, which will no doubt add some burden. But over time, hopefully they actually help to lessen the overall burden for particularly those operating across borders in this space. Excellent. Um, as I mentioned at the top, we're increasingly seeing an interconnection of regulatory risks. And I, I see money laundering as just sitting in the middle of this for a number of reasons. So um, the UK actually recently has issued a Amber Alert, which focuses particularly on the, um, the art storage sector. And that's defined pretty broadly to include auction houses, dealerships, free ports, warehouses, and everything in between, pretty much anyone who at any point stores art. Um, and that document is very interesting because it is a sort of cross-regulator, cross-law enforcement guidance document. Um, and it looks at these issues, both from the anti-money laundering perspective, but also from the sanctions perspective, particularly sanctions evasion, as well as from the perspective of trafficking and cultural property and other sort of predicate crimes that can lead to money laundering. Um, and, and really that guidance has been prompted by an increase in concern around um, sort of high net worth individual buyers, in some cases from higher risk jurisdictions such as Russia, becoming more involved in this market and the potential that attaches to that for heightened risk for participants in the market. So that's the background to the alert. And really what it does is underscores the importance, the critical importance of robust due diligence, as well as regular and ongoing monitoring of that diligence to make sure that those participating in that market aren't involving themselves or facilitating activity that itself would be illegal. Um, and so, you know, with, I think there is an assumption in that guidance that maybe there is a view in the art market that somebody else is dealing with that KYC and you don't need to. I'm not gonna comment on whether that's a fair or an unfair assumption, but that's the premise from which the guidance starts. Um, and I think where the guidance is helpful is to flag how interconnected a lot of these risks are and how even if you're on top of your regulatory obligations under the money laundering regs in the UK or the money laundering directive in the EU, um, in fact, there are other issues around the edge that can cause you some real problems. Um, and so principle among those is dealing with um, a designated person, a sanctioned person, or even more difficult, an entity that is owned or controlled by that sanctioned person, because you can screen all you want, those entities will not typically come up on those lists. And so understanding what information do I need to figure out if this buyer is problematic or if the person who is selling this item to me is problematic? That's something that sort of needs to be thought through. And I think where it's really important for those that are operating in the regulated sector who already feel the burden of, of the AML regulations is um, all activity is caught. So one transaction of, of 10 pounds or 10 euros could trigger those rules, even if your AML controls aren't required to kick in until a slightly higher price point. So that's something to just be very aware of. There are also a lot of rules that also touch on sort of making certain luxury items, which can include works of art available to people from certain countries or dealing in um, cultural property that has come illegally from various countries like Iraq, Syria, etc. These are all sort of creatures of, in the UK, of the sanctions regime. And so there is no de minimis. They apply to everybody. So even if you aren't operating in a, a regulated art market business, you still have to comply if the rules apply to you. Um, and then the other piece that the guidance touches on is sort of you becoming yourself involved in money laundering. 
So in the UK, there is a split between the controls you need to have as a regulated business and the crime of money laundering itself, which can be committed by anybody, has no de minimis value and has been on the statute book for over 20 years. So, um, you know, understanding how these risks impact your business and how your existing controls to deal with your sort of formal AML obligations maybe need to be tweaked or adjusted to make sure that you have coverage in these other areas. Um, the guidance is interesting because it helpfully flags a number of sort of warning areas that people should be alert to when sort of looking at risk in this space. So one is changes in client circumstance. And I think what's really important to remember is, you know, typically if you're part of the regulated sector, you have to refresh your client due diligence periodically. How periodically will depend on risk to some extent. Where some of these other areas can be difficult, you almost need to be doing that on a constant basis, because if somebody goes on the sanctions list tomorrow and you don't refresh your diligence under your AML policy for another year, you might be trading with that individual when you shouldn't be. And so understanding the interrelationship between those obligations is really important. Um, again, things to look out for in terms of just monitoring the business relationship. So you know, if you get requests to move items quickly or move them out of the jurisdiction super quickly, being alert to what the reasons for that are and whether they're legitimate or illegitimate. Um, if you're receiving sort of regular stage payments from um, an unclear source, understanding the context there to make sure that you're not sort of opening the door to risk inadvertently. Um, another thing we see a lot of on the AML side, also on the sanction side, is um, using shell companies, complex corporate structures, nominee shareholders, all sorts of different models to obscure the ultimate ownership and, and beneficial ownership of, of a particular entity. Um, they can be very high risk and also very hard to unpick often in practice. I say that from a bit of personal experience. Um, and then again, you know, being alert to sort of request to store objects that might be stolen or subject to other restrictions because they've been illegally removed from their country of origin. Um, or the sort of use of intermediaries without a sensible business purpose. These are all things that the Amber Alert sort of touches on and wants to bring to art market participants' attention as areas of possible risk. And I think it's helpful to sometimes think, how, how do my existing controls deal with that? Or do they deal with that? Um, so what are some of the challenges to developing a set of robust and streamlined controls that deal with your AML obligations and deal with some of these broader risks that are increasingly encroaching on that area? Um, so a challenge can be the different trigger points. So as I've described, you know, from, from Euro number one, some of these regimes like sanctions or the substantive money laundering offenses can be a risk for you whereas your sort of formal obligations under the AML regs or the AML directive may not kick in until a slightly higher point. So understanding how you're protecting yourself um, from those kinds of issues is really important. Um, proactively managing change. So again, making sure you're refreshing customer due diligence often enough that your screening is picking up on changes in customer status, particularly where you have ongoing relationships with your customers and it's not a sort of one-off type of transactional experience. Um, the other thing is being alert to riskier jurisdictions. So from an AML perspective, there is a list that we all are very aware of of riskier jurisdictions. But I think as you think more holistic about these issues, understanding that under the sanctions rules or under the bribery rules, there might be a slightly different set of jurisdictions that should be triggering in your mind the need to expand a little bit the diligence that you're undertaking. Um, one thing in practice that is increasingly problematic is access to relevant information. So we're seeing um, a lot of these obscure structures that I described or an unwillingness to sort of go beyond the very formal structure. Here's the information on how this trust is owned. But that doesn't always tell you who's sitting behind and controlling. And that increasingly is very important, particularly on, on the sanctions piece, which can create AML problems for you if you don't pick it up. So. Um, that's something to be aware of. And then the other thing I just wanted to flag was um, multiple reporting obligations. So Laura had spoken about this um, from the French perspective, and obviously there's the SAR regime and the DAML regime in the UK, um, but also some art market participants, including some auction houses, when they're dealing in certain items of gold and silver and precious stones, can have mandatory reporting obligations under the sanctions regime as well. And it's a crime to not 
report when you're supposed to. So I think understanding and making sure that it's clearly communicated to those who are responsible within the business, what those reporting obligations are and when they're triggered and when they need to be worried about. Um, so, you know, I think pulling that all together, I've given you lots of problems and I want to try and leave you with some sort of solution before I hand over to Raina. Um, you know, I think what's absolutely key and it goes beyond the formal AML obligations is understanding your risk exposure. And that is who you deal with, which counterparties you deal with, not just your customers. Where are you operating? And are you sort of dealing with, are you sourcing items from places that are considered to be higher risk, perhaps because there are sanctions on certain items coming from those places? Are you sending items to places that are higher risk? Um, sort of really understanding sort of all of those issues from the perspective of your business, because I think as the volume of regulation increases and what we're all expected to comply with increases, that has to be managed against, as Anthony said, making a living. And, you know, the resource and the risk need to be balanced in a proportionate way. So if you really understand your business and how these risks apply to it, you can make sensible risk-based decisions about what you need to do to stay compliant and meet your obligations in a way that is proportionate to your position in the market and, and otherwise. So that's one piece to think about. Additionally, understand the laws that apply to you. Um, obviously you understand the AML laws that apply in the countries where you're operating, but you know if you have personnel who have a nationality in a different country, that can bring other rules to bear when they're involved in certain matters and certain projects. So just understanding you know, which rules will apply um, and making sure that your controls reflect that in a holistic way rather than being piecemeal so that things get hoovered up and don't fall between the gaps. Um, and then just finally, you know, figuring out what is adequate and appropriate for that risk profile and then putting that in place. And I would say, you know, there is this increasing overlap between sanctions, between money laundering, and there is a lot of overlap in the information you need to gather to protect yourself against those risks. So rather than having necessarily five different policies that all do 60% of the same thing, um, trying to make sure that you leverage the information you're already gathering and do this in the most efficient way possible so that you can be compliant without breaking the bank. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to Raina so that she can um, she can delve a little bit more into some of the UK pieces. But thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all for the questions that you are formulating and putting into chat or those of you in the room passing um, to us. We have one more presenter and then we are going to switch and do a Q&A. To just slide up. Okay. All right. Um, our presenter, Rena, please take a seat. Thank you, Irina. Thank you very much for including me. It's been really super fascinating for me. There's oh, so much to learn. One second. Let me hear you. Uh, they are. Um, oh, it's not. Well, there we go. I'm using the other robot. We have one. Um, Atreya, can you see us? I can see the both of you now, and the screen share has stopped. Or maybe it's screen share. Can you see it? Uh, yes, I can see. It's a downloaded file, and uh, yeah. we can still see the Google Chrome, but we can see the slides as well. Okay, great. We can do that. Uh, so you can, yes, you can scroll. Yep. You just 
for some reason. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, thank you very much for including me in this. I found it super fascinating so far. Um, I'm going to focus on, I, I focus on the UK art market. I work with art advisors, the big auction houses, beat medium-sized auction houses, some people on the continent and some people in the US, but really the UK is the sweet spot. Uh, and the UK government has been super, super active in this space. Uh, they've told us we're high risk, that uh, they've repeatedly said that they think we're vulnerable to abuses. So they sort of shifted a bit the discussion to saying that we're money launderers to saying we're uh, victims of abuse of money launderers. Um, 30 seconds on really what it is, just because it leads to, for me, understanding what's unique about the art market. So the money laundering regulatory scheme was really about getting these terrible, terrible organized criminals to stop doing cross-border transactions. They use these layers, placement, layering, and integration, and they're trying to hide their dirty money from this human trafficking, and they try to keep control of money while being secret still and uh, retaining their anonymity. But the art market, as always, is slightly unique. We don't see those crimes. Uh, in my 30 years in the art market, uh, in and out of the compliance field, white collar crime is what we see in the art market, which makes it much more difficult to detect. So white collar crime is fraud, selling fakes, uh, um, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul inappropriately. Tax evasion is probably the biggest crime that I have seen over my years, uh, where it's a collector or an art advisor or a gallery behaving in a way so they minimize their taxes and sometimes they cross the line and get into tax evasion. Uh, we have the famous case uh, in France of the Wildenstein uh, family recently being uh, convicted of tax evasion using placement layering and integration, exactly the schemes that are classic to a money launderer. Uh, embezzlement, really super formal way of saying stealing from your boss and bribery. Um, I'm with you know Alex, I think these related crimes like bribery, sanctions violations, they all end up getting caught in this same sort of unattractive net and things to be worried about. Um, I made what I think is a handy dandy little chart of what the US, the UK, and um, our national risk assessment and our regulator have, oh, they're not seeing the slide. No, it's okay. Um, of the various risks that are typical in the art market. And there's a fair amount of consistency. I'm not gonna go through all the boxes. It's quite similar to the risks uh, that my esteemed colleagues have been describing. Um, the offshore structures, uh, intermediaries are, uh, Critical one, lack of price sensitivity is the biggest red flag. Most of my clients have never had a client who was not sensitive to price. Um, and then of course the remote, the remote nature, the classic ones. Um, so this is the source of the regulatory scheme for the art market. Everyone here probably knows this already, the fifth uh, directive. Uh, the words highlighted in red are where I think uh, when Alex was talking about the sort of varying implementation of the directive across Europe, all these things are defined differently across Europe. So it matters, it matters where you are, it matters who you're trading with, it matters what law is governing you. The UK decided to follow the fifth directive as it was negotiating its exit from the EU. So the UK is bound by the fifth directive, even though it came into effect after we left. Uh, they're now looking at maybe changing some tiny bits of it, but basically, this is what all of us are governed by, these, these marks here, plus the storage uh, regulations, which I'm not fo focusing on. Um, and the super ugly part um, in the UK, it's prison, it's fines, it's reputational damage for not complying with those um, regulations. Um, and I share these whopping big fines on these two big British banks because my whole theory and thesis for money laundering regulation in the art market is there's brilliant technology tools out there. More and more there's AI, there's online automated training. The banks have huge compliance departments, lots of lawyers, lots of process, lots of algorithms. They're getting fines, not because they had bad online training. They're getting fined because the humans who are applying it are missing the red flags. Invariably, those fines at the mature markets are because of the humans who are not implementing properly um, the regulations. This is a complicated slide. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. When we talk about in uh, 
at my company, FCS in the UK, customer due diligence, these are the five steps we walk people through. Uh, figuring out who is the customer is the hardest part in my book. Uh, the rest of this goes through, you verify them, you use your tech tool, you figure out the passport valid, source of funds and third-party payments, critical for the art market, third-party payments, third-party delivery, giant red flag. Uh, my experience is the UK art market, the dealers don't feel like it's such a big red flag. They usually know why property is either being shipped or paid for by somebody else. And that's where for me, there's a huge disconnect between what the government is thinking is a giant red flag and worry, and the traders, the, the traders being the art market. Uh, so there's a disconnect, which is a risk for the market, not for the government. Uh, and then the nature of the transaction, the whole, like, are they behaving out of their normal? Um, why are they buying? Does it make sense? Are they collecting? Did they get divorced? What are they doing? And you have a happy red flag up here. Then you've got to also look into the source of wealth. Like, where did they get the money? Anthony talked about that um, a little bit earlier talking about how to, asking a client, how did they make their money? Um, I find it interesting for the UK that kicks in really at the enhanced due diligence level. And we have um, different levels of due diligence than France, which I also found super fascinating. We've got simplified, which is for the big public companies that are super regulated, which is a very low level, but it has to be a very, uh, very, reg very heavily already audited and regulated entity. Um, and then there's normal, which I call here in this slide standard CDD, um, which is the top four bullets. And we get into enhanced due diligence whenever there's a red flag that's statutorily listed. All enhanced due diligence, you do not file an SAR. If you resolve the red flag, you don't file a suspicious activity report. And then you also have a money laundering officer that can say, actually, it's not in this technical list that's requiring me to do enhanced due diligence my instinct is telling me I should dig deep or something's not right. So I think that's kind of interesting. It's a, a, another opportunity for communication internationally where when we say enhanced due diligence, it doesn't mean you're reporting anything, but it would mean that uh, in France, which, which I was happy to learn. Um, so my human mantra, you know, it's your human skills. So if you're a businessman person and you've got a salesperson that, kind of is really enthusiastic, but doesn't have judgment, it's a giant risk for you because it's gonna be their client facing interactions. The human part of it is what will bring back to you um, the red flag nine times out of 10. Tech tools are brilliant. I think they're critical, lots of acronyms here, but typically um, they scrape public databases, they scrape adverse media, they scrape the sanctions list, they scrape criminal prosecutions, look for the national list of politically, politically exposed people, and they pull that together for you in a super nice report. And so you see on the right what the tech tool will give you, usually a really nice report, but that's again where people fall down. If they see a yellow flag, they see a red flag, they see an attention, and they don't do anything, then their tools haven't done much good for them. They need to take the action. Tech tool may come back lovely and full of green flags and good news, but if the client doesn't want the client doesn't want to give you ID, they don't want to meet you. They're changing their story. They're changing their invoices. Something about their behavior is odd, hesitant, suspicious. Then you've got uh, a human red flag that you may fall into the enhanced due diligence. Um, I really won't go through all of these, but it's just for you to say, you know, the UK art market gave a hundred pages of guidance uh, the first year, they updated it. Uh, HMRC gave us several pages online of guidance in the second year. Um, third year, again, we had changed guidance from his majesty's treasury. And then again, last year, uh, more changes. So the government in the UK has been super interactive. They have stakeholder meetings every month. They met extensively with the train before the train, the trade before um, the regulations went into effect, which resulted in the first 2020 HMT guidance, which was the collaborative uh, document. I highlight these two changes, uh, these two points, because the government has hit on them a lot. What's a customer in the art market and uh, who is an AMP? 
again, I, for interest of time, I won't go through all these bullets, but there, there's a lot of nuance and information and confusion in the UK. Uh, artists are not covered. So I could be an artist selling my paintings for 50,000 pounds at a time. I don't need to regulate myself. I don't need to get registered. I don't need to do anything. Um, customers and intermediaries are big areas where there's problems. Uh, customer is anyone who's paid uh a party who's paid for art or services, that's where you get the intermediaries, the art advisors, the interior designers, who are sort of the many of the chain transaction people in the art market. An intermediary you saw was in the regulation, it was in the directive itself. It's an active participant in the execution. So the confusion for the art market is what's the different in the UK anyway is, and I don't know if it's true here, what's the difference between an introducer so I just introduce somebody to Arena and then I go off and play golf and don't do anything, but still ask for a finder's fee versus I introduce Anthony to Arena and then I help her negotiate with him. If I'm an intermediary, then I'm an active participant and I'm caught by the regulations. If in the UK you're caught by the regulations, you need to register your name with HMRC. They need, you need to go through some tests and your name is available on this public registry. Uh, so if I'm trading with somebody who should be registered in the UK and who isn't, our regulator, the His Majesty's Revenue and Customs has told us I shouldn't deal with that person and I should consider reporting them. So we've got a slightly different structure. If I'm dealing with Arena and she is an intermediary and she's regulated and registered and she's uh in the north of England, and I know she's only got four clients and they're all in the north of England and they're all fifth generation British, maybe then I don't need to ask her who her client is. So this is a big carve out in the UK that the art market won where you don't have to go up and down the food chain. So this is a graphic of just what I've said because I'm not sure it's true in other locations. So you've got sort of Susie Seller comes to Art Market 1, and then Art Market 1 says to her friend, Art Market 2, do you know somebody who could buy this Picasso? No, but my friend Art Market 3 does. Then in terms of CDD, you only do CDD where the arrows are. So AMP 1 is doing it on their own seller in 2, and AMP 2 on their right and left, and AMP 3 on their right and left, which means AMP 1 doesn't know who the buyer is which means AMP 1 is going to have to make a concerted decision. Do I trust AMP 2 and AMP 3 enough to know that there are no sanctions, stolen property, or, or other nefarious risks? So the art market now in the UK is in this very odd position where they've got this huge win that was heavily negotiated to stop them from showing passports four times in a transaction chain, but then they have the sanctions risk. So they're taking very much what we call a risk-based approach, which they're entitled to take. But as I can't remember, I think Laura or Alex said, it starts at pound one, the obligation for sanctions uh, avoidance. So that's a, a quirk about the UK that I that I share. Our inspector, they've done, they, they uh, regulate more than 30,000 businesses. They regulate six other sectors. They have done in their lifetime more than a thousand, what we call inspections, which is basically in common parlance an audit. Uh, their outcomes um, are, are listed here uh, and proceed all the way to a criminal prosecution from simply saying you did mostly a good job. Quite different from the, the French process, HMRC started the inspections in the art market well over two years ago, uh, quite consistent with what Alex is describing, I think it was. It's very soft at the beginning and tolerant. Um, but June 2023, 20, uh, over the six sectors, these uh, HMRC has issued over three million pounds in fines. Uh, 240 of its over thousand uh, of the regulated entities Less than 50 of those are in the art market, and the vast majority of those in the art market are under 10,000 uh, pounds. I'm going to guess it's 95% are simply for failing to register. So when they're coming in and doing the inspections, so far of the ones they published, almost all of them have been very soft and for failing to register or for registering late with HMRC. Uh, the rumor on the street in London is very much that people are getting fined for, for violations, uh, for violations that relate more to the items on this slide, for not having a written risk assessment, for having a 
standard form cookie cutter risk assessment for not having a good policy. Uh, but mostly in the UK, it's really been simply for not registering. Um, I, I've sat in quite a few of the investigate uh, um, interventions and there have been real mistakes where ID wasn't obtained or the risk assessment wasn't brilliant. Uh, at HMRC, in the ones I've been involved, were quite lenient. I understand, rumor has it, the market is quite, quite small, that there are some big penalties and fines coming. Uh, the last notice was pretty recent. We'll expect another notice to, online. So HMRC lists the name of the person, the amount of their fine, and the regulation that they breached. So that's what that's what happens in the UK. Sorry, Thank I think you. I might have gone oh, over time. It's great. Um, don't go far. I wonder if you can sit here. Sure. I can ask our panelists to come back. Um, we apologize for some of the technical glitches. Um, as I said, we're here all learning something every day. Um, a big thank you to our guests who have been very kind and generous um, telling us about their work. Just one. I'll just need a picture. Um, let's see. I think um, what we are going to do is we've received a couple of questions. If there are questions in the room, please you know, raise your hand and use your mics. They're working. Um, but one of the questions was, what happens if you have done your due diligence, but there is a fire or something else? Um, are you off the hook? Any, um, go ahead. When you say there's a fire, the record, yeah, so right. Oh, the record, right. Right. right? Well, I can you I mean, be fined if there are no rough records? They existed, but then some well, kind it of... should be on now. I mean, there's also an obligation to keep a lot of those records uh, online. For example, the police book now, uh, for a number of years, the police book, which would list, uh any items that you have in your inventory, where they come from, who's consigned, who's buying it, that would need to be uh, online. Uh, so I, nowadays, I think most of the policies, most of the um, diligence you gather on clients should be digitalized. So it would be very surprising that you don't have any backup Okay. of the information somewhere. I, I don't really see an instance where, you know, there's no uh, hard copy, no digital record anywhere. Um, I have to say in the UK interventions, the HMRC asked, is it backed up? They asked, do you have a, a backup and secure? And they specifically asked, where are you keeping it? How is it stored? So I think... Um, if you had a fire and all your records were destroyed or your cloud got hit by a mosquito ball or something, um, I think I would suggest to somebody to try to reconstruct it, re reconstruct the files if possible. Um, there's a question about the fifth AML directive and how do you think you could improve the policy in the future? Lower the burden that is put on the art market participants, give more guidance, it seems that um, UK has done a little bit more work than the French market or French uh, jurisdiction. Um, let's try that's, that's what it appears to be. Um, I'm very pleased to have heard your presentation because we learned a lot there. Uh, but I'd like to just, uh, as we say in French, to raise a hair, but a rabbit-like hair. Uh, isn't there some form of rumor going around that the the limit of 10,000 will be lowered to five. That's what we're hearing. And um, that will change things drastically. Agreed. And I mean, it's an interesting one, I think, because when you look at some of the, the European-wide legislation that's on its way in in the next few years, I think there is that effort to try and maybe catch up with the UK and with some of the guidance that it provides. Um, I'm not sure about the 5,000 euro limit. Um, that, that would be terrifying. I mean, on some level, and it, it goes back to the point I was making before, I think there are so many other obligations now that sit alongside this that 
the, the dollar or the euro sign almost becomes irrelevant because you're exposing yourself to some quite serious risk if you're not thinking about some of these issues more broadly anyway. But um, yeah, I mean, that would that would materially draw a lot more people in, I would imagine, and, and create quite a few issues. One, just, I just want to say one of the things about the art market, which uh, we, uh, which I just discovered is this uh, cross-border situation where one has to uh, adapt and apply the regulations from each member state that you're operating in. And uh, I would like just to make the point that, let's say, French dealers who were just operating at Tefra or at Rafa or going to Arco or to Art Basel, how are they going to be able to implement this the regulations? Do they implement their own national regulations in a foreign country? Uh, do they have to implement the foreign country's regulations? Do they have to implement both? And this is something that is absolutely not discussed and not, it's not even made clear, it's just not discussed. We have absolutely no idea. Yeah, and I, th I think on that point, um, there's likely a distinction between what legally you probably are required to do, which I suspect is com comply with all those laws that apply to you, right, which might include the foreign law for the time that you are physically in that country trading, doing business. I think the balancing act is, you know, enforcement agencies, when I'm not counseling on how to stick within the rules, I'm defending clients that have got into difficulties. And I think the reality is enforcement agencies, certainly in the UK, but also I think in Europe more generally, um, often are quite resource constrained. And so I think when you're thinking about a risk based approach and how you comply, you know, if, if you're a huge player in the market and you're not complying with those multiple regimes, you've probably got a problem at some point in your future. If you're an individual dealer that travels to a trade fair very periodically, obviously you shouldn't do anything antagonistic, <laughs> but equally, I think the likelihood of that becoming an enforcement action in that third country for that person is probably relatively remote, unless there's some other risk factor to that particular trade. So let's say you sold a piece to a, a sanctioned person. <laughs> At that point, I think the bets are off, right? <laughs> but you know there is a difference between the legal obligation and the enforcement risk and obviously you want to comply all the time with all the rules that apply to you but equally i think you know that's probably the balance you have to strike um just on that point though um the uk uh, hmrc is fairly focused on non-uk uh art market participants coming in for the fairs uh and they have twisted and tried and changed their guidance two three times to try to figure out how to compel the non-UK participants to comply. I think they're going to come up with another regime this year, but I think they're unusual. I think they're particularly focused on trying to have a level playing field. And because they have so many Americans that come in who don't have any obligation, uh, but they've been very crisp that anybody coming to the UK for a fair has to comply with the UK. Maybe for France quickly, um, I would say customs are keen to control how you know, however much they're able to control. So I would say you know even if you're going to a fair and you may um, not properly record a sale that you have done in a in a fair abroad, French customs would still look at that if you're uh, registered in France, obviously. But um, and I think it it. Uh, connects to something that was said earlier. If you're a French uh, gallery or um, auction house in France, but you're integrated in an international group company, uh, well, French customs may want to look into some of your transaction conducted in another jurisdiction, London, New York, if they were conducted by an employee who's a French citizen. So you could have other um, connections that are will be uh, picked on by customs to try to bring back uh, those um, transactions within their jurisdiction. So yeah, if it's a, a French citizen who's an employee of the gallery or the auction house in New York or London, that could be a way for French custom to uh, look into those transactions that those individuals may have conducted abroad. Interesting. And I think one thing we are seeing is an increase in coordination and information sharing between regulators in, in AML and in other areas, but it's growing. And I think 
that goes to risk as well. And I think the risk today and the risk in two, three years time likely are very different beasts. Um, I wanted to ask a question and, and unfortunately Anthony has to run, so we'll have to deal without the actual yeah, art the market. <laughs> the last question is what happens to other jurisdictions? So we heard about France and we know UK is being very active. What are the other jurisdictions we should be looking to either for guidance or to say they need to do more? <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, if there are questions for you, are we allowed to send them to you? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, what other jurisdictions do you think are um, key? Well, I think the three for mine, uh, obvious, are uh, the US, Switzerland, and Hong Kong which don't yet have any anti-money laundering regulations for the art market and sanctions are weak in Hong Kong. So at least Switzerland and the US have the sanctions risk to make people look into who the who they're dealing with and be more curious. But um, I think those jurisdictions, it's, you know, the governments have different views. I think the Swiss government has the view that the art market isn't that vulnerable to money laundering and they've got a higher threshold of 100,000. Um, so they've got a, you know, they've got their own justification and understanding, and they're not uh, as worried about it. Uh, the U.S. has kind of got the both bad worlds, where they say it's a risk, and they've done reports, and they want the dealers to ask to best practices, but they haven't put it on the top of the priority list to regulate. So it's, it's, I think it's a very tricky situation in the U.S. to have the government say you need to follow best practices best practices are not defined within the context of the US. There's no regulation yet specifically for the art market. So it's really tough for them to know what is best practice and if they make a mistake and then they're regulated in a year, you know, it's tough. I think it's really tough. I think what's also interesting from the US perspective is the the formal regulatory structure is lacking and yet tools and mechanisms are being found to enforce action that in another jurisdiction, say the UK, the EU would be considered to fall short of the yep. rules. And so I think, you know, as with many things, the US is more enforcement oriented than many other jurisdictions. And I think that's the balance at the moment. And it's a hard balance to strike. You're absolutely right, because I think there's probably more enforcement risk there on some levels for some people. Absolutely. And yet there isn't a formal obligation to do the things that other people are having to do. And, and that can be a really hard balance. Yes, no, and it's a fair point. The US is prosecuting and arresting and seizing more cases in the art market than any other jurisdiction by some long way. So it is, it's a it's a very interesting sort of schizophrenia that the US has on this topic. <laughs> Um, there's a question about the sharing of information across jurisdictions. So I was very pleased to learn about the police book, which sounds terrific. Um, <laughs> I, does an art market participant or somebody outside can have access to these files? No, it's the police, only the police. Uh, and then, of course, they can share if there's an ongoing investigation on a specific participant, police customs, uh, and Prakfal has all those reports as this sort of database, we share their information, but the police book is really, uh, it's a control tool used by the police. Um, so um, it's really the record of all sales and activity of any um, art market participant. Every single transaction is in this police yeah. book? Yeah. Freedom of information. Mm -hmm. oh. Um, what I'm not sure if um, this question was addressed, but what about digital um, information? Is there a use of blockchain technology or other sources to keep track of ownership, for example, or individuals who have been checked for due diligence purposes? In the private sector? Anywhere. Uh, my sense is so far the market is uh, incredibly reluctant to use the blockchain. Um, I think eventually and personally that the blockchain will overtake and will be a huge tool and uh, device, but the art market is typically really reluctant and slow to pick up on new technologies. Certain pockets of it are really adapting to and using the blockchain, uh, but I think because it's such a new market and who owns what and which blockchains are they and uh, what are the rules isn't yet, there's no big player or standard uh, development other than the art Basel 
uh, RQL uh, blockchain, and I don't know what the uptake is on that. And I guess just more generally on information sharing, I mean, what you see, and this is largely from a UK perspective, but I, I can speak to some of the other jurisdictions as well. So I think what you're increasingly seeing is, you know, the information from a SAR, for example, will get shared with any law enforcement body that it's relevant to. So that's one form of information sharing, which can throw up other issues that may be problematic. Also increasingly, say under the sanctions regimes, banks, insurance companies have to mandatorily make reports if they think that there's activity going on that's problematic under those rules. So if you have art transactions that are seen to be suspicious or evasionary of the sanctions, then there is an obligation to report that to the UK government. What I will say is the UK government has now signed um, cooperation agreements with the EU, with the US and with a number of other states. And there is a lot of collaboration sharing that sort of information about a particular bucket of clientele and assets, but that's growing. And there's also a lot of movement towards having the banks themselves being able to share that information so that they can appropriately protect themselves from inadvertently facilitating problematic activities. So we're seeing a lot more of it and I think we'll see that continue. Um, and of course it, it, you know, it becomes a very relevant and important factor because that can start then impacting your ability to get insurance coverage or your banking relationships or your financing relationships as well. So, you know, it, it can kind of snowball. Thank you. Um, we have, I believe we've answered most of the questions um, that are online. Um, we have to wrap up, um, but if there are questions that percolate and if you want to ask them, please email us. Uh, we'll share them with our speakers. And um, please take a look at the handouts. Thank you very much for your time. And um, for those of you who are interested in seeing how well we've done with challenges, um, we're planning <laughs> to be back in May to talk about AI and copyright. So it's going to be a different topic, but um, probably same place. We'll, we'll play a little bit more with technology. We hope to see all of you again and again. And thank you so much for your expertise and your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Athreya. Thank you all for joining us. And um, with that, we are wrapping up. Thank you.